Hello and welcome to lesson 5, Bowlby's theory of attachment, monotropy and the evolutionary approach. Before we get started, just a quick recap on the evolutionary approach. Remember, we're interested in natural selection. So organisms that develop adaptive uh, features such as behaviours or uh, physical um, abilities are more likely to survive and then pass those abilities on to subsequent generations. From an evolutionary perspective, the interesting thing about human offspring is that they are fairly immobile for the first you know, three years of their lives. They depend so heavily on their caregiver. Compare that with you know, horses or um, other precocial animals who can pretty much get up and walk within uh, sometimes a few days, weeks of birth. So babies are hugely dependent. And according to Freud and Bowlby and a series of other uh, theorists, they've developed behavioral uh, adaptations to help them survive. So attachment for John Bowlby is an evolutionary mechanism. One of the key concepts is monotropy. Monotropy refers to the possession of a single attachment figure that is more important to you than all the others. This is usually the mother. Bobby called it the mother, though more recently we would tend to refer to the primary attachment figure or PAF, P-A-F. And that's because increasingly we understand that the mother does not hold the special place that perhaps Bowlby gave her in the sense that she is not the only person that the offspring can form an attachment to. Social releases we've talked about before. Social releases are these uh, inbuilt abilities that babies have to elicit a caregiving response. So a baby smiles and the caregiver smiles uh, back. The baby cries and the caregiver tries to feed the baby or take care of her in a different way. A another key concept, according to Bowlby, and we'll tie all this together later, is the idea of the critical period. So that attachment must take place within a certain period, else it will never take place. Think about Lorenz and his goslins. If they didn't form an attachment within the first couple of days, they never did. And as a result, um, that puts their survival potentially at a disadvantage. So these concepts influenced Bowlby's thinking when it came to attachment. There are also three laws that he developed. So Bowlby's laws include the law of continuity. The more constant and predictable a child's care is, the better quality of the attachment. Law of accumulated separation. The effects of every separation from the mother add up. Uh, and the safest dose of separation then is zero separations and innate. Attachment formation is innate and has evolved through natural selection. In an essay, typically, you might not include these. It's entirely up to you, but this demonstrates a, a wider knowledge of the topic. Right. This is the most crucial element of Bowlby's theory of attachment. Essentially, he borrows ideas from cognitive psychology such as schemas. And he develops this idea that we have this internal working model. So an internal working model is a bit like a blueprint. A blueprint for how relationships should uh, be, attachment uh, should be. So this blueprint is built based on our relationship with our primary attachment figure. If our relationship is secure, then our blueprint will be uh, one of a secure relationship. And therefore, when we grow older and we form relationships with other adults, we'll have secure relationships. And when we have children, we'll develop secure attachment to them as well. So it affects parenting style and it affects adult romantic relationships, which is something we're going to look at uh, a bit later in the course. The continuity hypothesis sees attachment style as just merely continuing from that first relationship. So as we were saying, if you're insecure as a child, you're likely to be an insecure adult. But whether or not it's fixed is something we're going to look at in just a few moments. So here's a model of how it works. 
primary care as behavior towards the child. So this is where we build our internal working model based on our interaction with our uh, primary caregiver. The child develops the working memory, uh, the working model, and this model is of itself. And it's made of three belief systems, really. Beliefs about whether you're lovable, beliefs about your caregiver, beliefs about the world in a broader sense. Now, if you feel positive and loved as a child, this will lead to secure attachment. And this will actually feed back into the primary caregiver's behavior. Think about a child who is affectionate towards their parents. They are far more likely, the parents, far more likely to reciprocate. They're going to be easier to look after, more fun, more enjoyable to spend time with. Compare that to, you know, a child who's quite difficult and, and tantrums a lot and cries. That's going to be a very uh, strained relationship. So it's all a feedback mechanism. If they feel unloved and rejected, they may avoid uh, attachment behaviors. They may avoid intimacy. And this will feed back into the reaction to the caregiver. If your child is avoiding you and your um, interactions, you may avoid them because it's too difficult to um, engage. And then angry, confused, resistance. So if you're feeling this, again, that behavior is going to feed back. Your parent may be more inconsistent towards you because they're not sure why you're angry, why you're confused, they don't know how to deal with it. So that's the internal working model. As a theory then, let's see if this stacks up. Well, there's some evidence that comes from Tronic and we've seen the still face experiment already. Essentially in this experiment, the mother interacts with the child, she then goes deadpan and doesn't smile or say anything. The baby starts to get stressed and is trying to elicit a reaction via the release of social releases <clears throat> and then eventually the um, baby becomes extremely distressed and will actually just sort of roll over and give up now this is interesting because this suggests that attachment behaviors are innate to some extent but more importantly it shows how how important social releases are in forming that attachment how babies are equipped with these tools to try and elicit uh, attachment behavior from the adult. These are not skills that they could necessarily have learned, but will have uh, partially been, been there since birth and honed through their experience. And that's pretty much what I just said. All right, uh, further evidence then, Schaefer and Emerson, well, they criticize the idea of monotropy, the idea that we have one attachment figure that's more important to us than all the others. Schaefer and Emerson say, well, in their study, they found that 29% of the children had already formed several attachments simultaneously. So they didn't have a primary attachment figure. They had multiple attachments. Um, and so this criticized the idea of monotropy. Other findings were that actually many children did not form attachments to to people who provided the physical care and the mothers were providing most of the physical care. So these were two subsequent figures. So we've criticized, um, we've said there's some evidence of social releases and we're criticizing um, the idea of monotropy though. Now, Bailey carried out some really interesting research. 99 mothers were assessed with one-year-old babies on the quality of their attachment with their own mother, and that was assessed using a standard interview, and then the researchers observed them interacting with their own children independently. Now, mothers uh, who reported poor attachment with their parents were observed to have poor attachment with their children. So this is evidence for the continuity hypothesis, isn't it? That you have this insecure attachment style as an infant with your own parent and you grow up and you feed that insecure uh, attachment into your own children as you um, begin to try and form attachments with them. So evidence for internal working model, continuity hypothesis there. 
Further evidence from continuity hypothesis comes from Hazen and Shaver. We're going to look at this study in a lot more detail later. They placed a love quiz in the North American uh, newspaper. Essentially, they correlated the attachment type, secure and insecure, of uh, these participants with their adult attachment style or relationship style. And they found a strong relationship between childhood attachment and adult attachment. So if you're an insecure avoidant child, you grow up to sort of value physical intimacy without the emotional um, connotations. If you're a resistant child, you grow up to be quite jealous and would agree with statements like, I often want to get closer to other people uh, more than they want to get closer to me. And if you were secure, you had a pretty healthy adult a set of relationships. Some evidence against critical period as well comes from Tizard and Hodges and Rutter who suggest that children who are institutionalised and fail to form a strong attachment during this critical period could still actually develop attachment later if, if they had a support school environment or some substitute care. So this suggests that it's not as fixed as it seems. It's not fixed necessarily in childhood and can change throughout our lives. And one of the strongest pieces of evidence for the idea of this innate evolved attachment sense comes from Harlow's monkeys. Remember, Harlow's monkeys were separated from their, uh, their real mothers and placed with surrogate mothers in cages. They formed a strong attachment to the cloth mothers who provided some form of contact comfort. Now, there was no learning, there was no feedback, and we know that reward wasn't involved in it. So this is strong evidence that the monkeys had some sort of innate uh, ability to form attachments. Now, what makes Harlow's study even more supportive of Bowlby is those infants that were reared in isolation grew up to be um, psychologically disturbed. And infants in uh, Harlow's experiment who then went on to have babies of their own later turned out to be very poor mothers they would neglect their children and sometimes they would even um, murder them and murder kill them this suggests that you know poor parenting or poor attachment as a child is continuous and continues with the continuity hypothesis well, that's Bowlby's theory of attachment in a nutshell. If you have any questions, as always, you know where I am. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. And I will see you around. Bye.